Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the St. Tammany Chamber of Commerce. This is our LABI legislative update today on March 17th, 2021. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Hope you guys are going to have good luck of the Irish blessings to you, your family, to your business, and, and hope things are going well. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Uh, we have always liked to do this, of course, in person, but with, with, with the, of course, all the, the protocols of, of COVID, we said we can let's go at least get this going and we'll get this uh, session going for you virtually. It is being recorded. Uh, and we have a great group of, of panelists who are going to be uh, talking to us today about what's happening, what's coming up at our legislative session. But I always like to kick off every uh, chamber event. We always begin with uh, uh, some God and country. So let's have our invocation and Pledge of Allegiance brought to you today by Barbara Doyle. Barbara is uh, with the Slidell Savings Magazine. Uh, she's a member of our Advocacy Public Policy Committee. So Barbara, uh, please take it over and do an invocation and pledge. Thank you. Um, let's bow our heads. God, our Father, giver of life, we entrust the United States of America to your loving care. You are the rock on which this nation was founded. You alone are the true source of our cherished rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of a happiness. Reclaim this land for your glory and dwell among your people. Send your spirit to touch the hearts of the nation's leaders. Open their minds to the great worth of human life and the responsibility that accompanies human freedoms. Remind your people that true happiness is in, rooted in seeking and doing your will. We ask for your hedge of protection around our military and our police officers and thank you so much for them that they give us, help us protect our freedoms and our securities. We just ask all of this in the awesome mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Yeah. And the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, fantastic. Well, thank you, Barbara. And again, those of you I haven't had a chance to meet yet, uh, I am Tom Meyer of Benefit Planning Group. I have the honor of being chairman this year for the St. Tammany Chamber of Commerce. But joining us on this webinar, we also have our partners uh, who helped put this on, uh, partners with St. Tammany Corporation and the North Shore Home Builders. We have them joining us as well, uh, partnering with us. Uh, a lot's going on, but we also have, of course, I didn't uh, miss this, we have a lot of our elected officials also joining us on this Zoom call today. We have uh, State Treasurer John Schroeder joining us, Parish President Mike Cooper, Senator Beth Mazel and Patrick McMath. We have State Representatives Mary Dubasson, Richard Nelson, Mark Wright, and Bob Owen. We have Sherry Sable Campbell uh, representing Ambassador uh, Louis Fitzwarris. We have our regional representatives from U.S. Senators Bill Cassidy and John Kennedy and Congressman Steve Scalise are also joining us. And please also welcome several of our active members of our Advocacy and Public Policy Committee uh, also in the Zoom call. So we have a lot of people, a lot of y'all signed in. Uh, we will have uh, um, an opportunity. We'll be able to have questions that will be uh, text in. We'll have you, you know, put those on the text and we'll be able to respond to those questions as well. But of course, now joining us is our, our president, uh, Lacey Osborne uh, from the St. Tammy Chamber. Lacey, can you give us an update on what's happening with our chamber? Thank you, Tom. And I was just looking at the um, attendee list and we have several active chamber members on the Zoom this morning. Um, happy to announce just in general that we do plan to begin in-person events in April. Uh, we pushed that up a little bit, and um, our first in-person event is actually scheduled for April 28th at the Slidell Municipal Auditorium. It's our Live Better uh, third attempt, third reschedule, and uh, we do still have some seats available if you're interested in joining those that registered to originally attended in September. Um, yesterday, I enjoyed uh, getting to know our new state rep from the Slidell area, Bob Owen, um, our vice chairman of the board, chair-elect David Boudreau also joined us for lunch. And we are, we are starting to rebuild. We feel like we missed, a, you know, everybody missed 2020, kind of skipped a year. And we're looking forward to joining our delegation at the Capitol this year. Um, we have some events in our heads that aren't actually on paper or on the calendar yet. But, 
<laughs> excuse me. Of course, we're very appreciative of Lobby and Stephen. Thank you for putting us on your schedule for this ever important annual Lobby Legislative Update. I'm sure that we will be um, joining you and supporting several of the issues that are on the uh, the bills being presented. Um, few in-person events this week. We do have a ribbon cutting in Slidell at Units on, at 109 Production Drive. It is a partnership of Sam Caruso and he's been active in the East St. Tammany Chamber and a great leader in the East St. Tammany community. So if you're able to join, that'll be from four to six this Thursday afternoon. Um, on May 20th, we are gonna have our State of the Parish event, which was also postponed. So we will hear from Parish President Mike Cooper about where he stands in his um, positions and issues and developments as we go into his second year as our parish president. Ever important this Saturday is an election in St. Tammany, please vote. Our board and public policy committee studied the issue and there, it is a drainage tax renewal. It's a renewal, it, gonna, it produces approximately $4 million total. And it's, uh, this is really, really important that we support this. And, Drainage is one of our biggest issues. So I'm very, very proud. I wanna give a shout out to Mike Soche, who has chaired our public policy committee. He's now in his second year. Uh, the committee has looked at some critical, critical issues and spoken out and there's been a lot of behind the scenes and that's how you get things done. I think we all know it's the meeting before the meeting and after the meeting. and. I encourage anyone on this call to join that committee. And if uh, you know it's not uh, anything to be afraid of, it's great conversations. And if you wanna be a part of that, you can speak to Mike or me or Jessica, Barbara Doyle, Tom, and just get a little more involved. Just get on the list and, and be more informed about what we as a chamber are looking at. Um, let's see, yes. I think that concludes my remarks and I'm gonna turn it over now uh, to our sponsor. Our sponsor today is Senator Patrick McMath. Uh, Patrick is uh, one of our own. He's been a member of the chamber for several years, a member of our board, uh, Covington Council at large, and we are very proud of his first year's accomplishments and look forward to uh, great things from Patrick. Great town hall last night between Patrick and Representative Mark Wright. And I know he's making the rounds in his district. So Patrick, thank you for being our sponsor today and take it away. Absolutely, Lacey. Thank you for uh, the introduction. Um, I'm coming to you uh, live from the Dakota restaurant. I have uh, the honor of, of um, <clears throat> introducing uh, uh, a very special visitor to, to, to my district and our community, and that's uh, Senate President Paige Cortez, um, who is, uh, we just wrapped up a, a breakfast with some, um, some community leaders, and, and he and I will be speaking to um, uh, another group here at, at noon. And, uh, and yeah, Lacey, you're right, we, you know, it's, it's that time of year, it's the pre-session session, which I'm sure uh, our guest uh, speaker today can attest to this. This is this is busier than actually when we're in session. Um, this is when everybody wants to to you know to meet with you, explain you know all the important things that uh, that either their business or their trade, uh, their industry uh, does for the community or the state, and uh, and and ask us not to take money from them. It's basically what all of these meetings <laughs> entail. Um, and so, uh, look, we're very eager. Uh, I know I'm, I'm speaking for not just you know, myself, but also the entire uh, St. Tammany delegation uh, to to say that we're 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 very we're ready to 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 get in uh, over to Baton Rouge and 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 actually start the work that we're all planning and um, on right now. I know a lot of us are 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 hard at work working on bills that that seek to to make St. Tammany uh, and the state stronger in terms of 
in terms of economic development and 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 getting us back on our feet uh, and getting our businesses and our Louisiana families uh, back to work. Um, so there's going to be a number of bills. Tax reform is going to be a huge, huge issue uh, this this session. I'm sure um, our guest is going to be speaking about that. And so with that, I'd, I'd like to make a formal introduction. Uh, Stephen Wagensback will be our guest speaker today. Um, very proud to, to be able to introduce you, Stephen. Stephen is the president and CEO of uh, Louisiana Association of Business and Industry. As the state's Chamber of Commerce and Manufacturers Association, Lobby is the largest business advocacy group, representing more than 2,200 business members and 324,000 employees. With over two decades of experience in federal and state politics, Stephen has earned a reputation as an active voice for reform policy in Louisiana. In addition to numerous personal outreach efforts, he writes a weekly political column that runs in a publication throughout the state. Before joining Lobby, Stephen served as a member of the State Board of Education and as a senior advisor to former Louisiana Governor Bobby Jindal. Prior to that, he spent 10 years working on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C. Stephen is a Louisiana native and holds a bachelor's degree from Louisiana State University, as well as a law degree from the Columbus School of Law at the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C. And over the past year, Stephen and I have, um, have gotten to know each other. I consider him a good friend. Um, spent last week over at uh, Lobby's headquarters in Baton Rouge at a, a Republican uh, delegation retreat. Uh, he's, a, he's a wonderful leader for our state and uh, I'm very proud to, to introduce him today. So, Stephen. Well, thank you, Senator McMath. I, I appreciate that very much. Um, those were very kind words and I would say ditto. Um, in the last year, I've had a chance to, to work closely uh, with you. And um, I think the people of St. Tammany need to know that they're, pr they're pretty privileged to have someone like you in the legislature uh, fighting day in, day out. You bring a lot of smarts, you bring a lot of common sense. Uh, sometimes those things don't go hand in hand with you, they do. And um, I appreciate your approach to policymaking and look forward to working with you for years to come and the other members of the St. Tammany delegation to try to just uh, provide solutions to Louisiana's problems. Many of our problems are not unique, but they are there. And um, it takes a little, little brain power, a little will and a little cooperation. And um, I think we can be surprised how we can all work together and get things done. So I wanna thank you for your leadership on that along with all your colleagues in the St. Tammany area. And I, you know, I saw on the screen earlier, we also have, um, you know, State Treasurer John Schroeder, I think on the call, who also originally came from that area. And I wanna also just send a thank you out to him for years. He's also been a very uh, thoughtful, common sense, smart leader, and um, has done great things for the state, but also for that for that region. And um, I've enjoyed working with him as well. And uh, you almost have something in the water over there because y'all continue to produce uh, good cooperative people to work with that uh, know what they're doing. So thank y'all for that and keep, keep sending them to Baton Rouge. We'll take them any chance we get. Um, I have to share a screen here. Mitch in my office here is gonna help me figure this out. So Mitch, tell me what to do here. Screen two, all right. Open the PowerPoint, that. Boom. Uh, that. Yep. Are we good? We're good. All right. Thankful to my partner in crime here. I think we have the PowerPoint. You should be able to see a little face in the corner if you want. You can minimize that if you don't want to see it. That's not going to hurt my feelings. But um, look, I, I do uh, appreciate Lacey and her team have always been a great um, group to work with. We, you know, as the State Chamber of Commerce, we work, we work with local chambers all across the state. And there's a lot of great people, a lot of great businesses involved locally. And, and we, we, you know, it's fun to work with them all, but Lacey and her team are some of the best. And we've really had a great time working with them and we've made a lot of uh, um, impact with them. And so Lacey, I wanna thank you and your entire squad there um, for doing a good job and look forward to continuing uh, working with you uh, for years to come to make Louisiana a better place to not just start a business and open a business, but also raise a family. Um, so with that, I wanted to go into a presentation, talk a little bit about the state of the economy, talk a little bit about where Louisiana is, and then talk about, you know, the session that Senator McMath mentioned. There are some interesting opportunities coming up pretty soon to where we can make some progress, not just to help in the immediate issues we're dealing with, but also in some of the systemic problems Louisiana's faced for years here in Louisiana. So with that, let's get to it. Um, before we look through the windshield, let's look at the rearview mirror for a second. Last year and a half has been a challenge for everyone. And everyone's got a different story to tell on what that challenge has been. You all are business leaders and you've got a business story. 
but many of you are also mothers and fathers, your sons and daughters, your neighbors, and you've got a personal story to tell as well. There's no doubt COVID-19 has impacted us all in the near term and the long term. Uh, that affects us personally, but it also affects us professionally, but also as a state, it needs to affect us on how we want to finally come to that day of reckoning where we start tackling systemic issues that quite frankly, we've ignored for far too long in Louisiana. So let's look at that rear view mirror for a second. For your business perspective, you all know this story very well. Many of you had to close your doors. Many of you had employees and customers you know, wander where it's been hard to get them to come in. You had to retrofit your facility, your protocols, your handbooks. You had to go out and buy PPE. You had to sometimes retrofit how the distancing was taking place in, in some of your retail establishments. And, and also you had to incorporate working virtually. And you know, some, there's been some good story to tell on that. But also what I hear from businesses is, hey, you know, how do we keep our culture? You know, many businesses have a very, you know, deep ingrained culture that makes them great, makes them unique. How do you keep that when a part of your, your business workforce is working virtually? And so folks are, are going through that right now. As a state, the numbers tell somewhat of a stark story. You know, you have a couple of industries that have done, you know, well during the issue. But the truth is, as a state, our unemployment levels are over 8%. This point last year, we had almost 200,000 more jobs, about 170,000 uh, to be exact. Um, there's about 60,000 unemployment claims happening per week right now. The sheer number of those claims that have been for so long has drained our unemployment trust fund. And before the pandemic, Louisiana had a top 10 unemployment trust fund. It was well-funded. It, it had smart policies in it. It was secure. It was, it was one of the models in the country. And just like every other state, that unemployment trust fund has been drained because of the sheer volume of unemployment, the enhanced unemployment that's come in. Um, and so now we've got a drain fund that is depending on federal loans um, to, to be filled up. And so that's a, a huge issue we have here as a state. Um, I mentioned some of the closures and downsizing and retrofits. I mentioned, you know, thankfully some of the PPP loans have come in to help some of those businesses, but all the while, the truth is um, state and local government has not had to deal with, with budget crisis. The truth is the feds have pumped money into states all across the country. Louisiana is no exception. And that money has able to, uh, to protect government all throughout. And so um, I, I think there's an interesting contrast there in the, in the real world, in the private sector, if it's a small business, if it's a big business, if it's a family, you've dealt with real world issues. You've had to shift on the fly. You've had to battle, scratch and claw to stay afloat. On the government side, there's been a, a pretty big uh, wave of, of investment from the federal level to help mitigate that. In fact, we haven't seen one cut yet come in yet. And so, look, that's a good thing. No one wants services to get cut unnecessarily, but there, it does lead a parity disparament there um, that we have to address and be understanding of as we go into the capital this session. So the big issues that we're still fighting going into the session, one, I mentioned the unemployment trust fund. We've got about 130, 150 million dollars we've borrowed from the federal government. Um, we need about a billion more to get that fund back to where it was before. Um, and so you can either use loans, you can either use big taxes, or you can use some of the federal relief dollars that are coming down to help replenish some of that fund. Um, we're thankful to hear that legislative leaders and the governor himself have said that they want to use some of those federal stimulus dollars to start refilling that unemployment trust fund. That is smart policy. We thank them for, for thinking that way and we hope the legislature this session can, can, can implement that. Every dollar from stimulus used to replenish that fund is one less dollar in new taxes that have to be implemented from, a, from the business community to refill it. And keep in mind, if you put new taxes on the business community to refill the fund, all you're doing is sending an incentive to business not to hire, to scale back hiring. And if we know we have an unemployment level over 8%, the last thing you wanna do is send that incentive. So using stimulus dollars to replenish that fund, it seems to be a bipartisan uh, thought and we hope it becomes a bipartisan solution in this session. The second big issue pressing from the pandemic is quite frankly, oil and gas. We all know oil and gas is a huge issue for Louisiana's economy. And whether you work in oil and gas or not, you know, as a service-based economy, we all benefit from oil and gas investment. Whether you are in a service company industry, whether you're in a restaurant, a caterer, a print shop, a delivery shop, you name it, oil and gas investment tends to, to help you through the ripple effect. And right now, the last year, as people have stopped traveling, the, the, uh, the price and demand for oil and gas has gone down, which has hurt investment. And then on top of that, we all know the federal administration, the Biden administration has put a leasing ban in place 
um, which impacts federal lands and waters. And considering over 90% of our petroleum in Louisiana is produced in the Gulf of Mexico, a leasing ban on federal waters uh, hurts, hurts us bad. And so we need that, that leasing ban to be lifted as soon as possible. And we're working with our delegation to try to put pressure on the administration to revisit that policy where they can. And then the last piece is the stimulus. Um, look, there's no doubt that the stimulus being sent by Washington has a lot of things in it that quite frankly are not stimulus related, are not COVID-19 related. And in fact, they're more um, agenda related by, by who's controlling Congress. And despite having said that, there are some things in there. The PPP loan, I mentioned some of the dollars that can be used to enhance unemployment trust fund deficits. Those things we need to use wisely. Other dollars that are going to state and local government right now directly, it's important that the state and taxpayers have some level of accountability over that to see how those dollars are being spent to make sure they're being spent on priorities. And I think the legislature is gonna to wanna to also uh, do that this session sometime. So those are some of the big issues lingering from the pandemic as we march into a regularly scheduled session. So with all that, there's a lot of doom and gloom, right? A lot of negative Nancy stuff. It's tempting to look out your quarantined window and say, man, there's no hope. Things are really dreary outside. Our future is just not going well. This isn't gonna work. I beg to differ. I think there's a reason for optimism. And I'm gonna tell you why. I was just introduced by Senator Patrick McMath. Lacey just said that she just got to uh, visit with Representative Owen. We've heard other names on there, Representative Dubasan and others. There is a influx of new business-minded legislators across the state that were elected a year and a half ago. And they all came to the Capitol with one clear objective, to make Louisiana better. They didn't run as you know historic career political animals that have been in that building forever. They didn't run to protect all the sacred cows and make sure no one messed with the status quo. They ran to be open to solutions, open to tackling problems, and open to getting stuff done to make Louisiana better. And that business-minded legislator is already showing uh, impact. You know, we kind of viewed this term at the beginning, since we had a new crop of legislators coming in that understood how the economy worked, we urged them all, take a four-quarter approach to this. Let's view this term, this four-year term, as a four-quarter game. And we asked them last year on the first quarter, the first year, take a hard look at legal reform. Take a look at how we respond from COVID-19. And that legislature did it. They passed historic legal reform that is going to lower auto insurance rates. It's already helping to bring in new insurance providers to the market. And while they were there when the COVID-19 pandemic hit, they shifted in real time and added some legal protection for businesses and manufacturers in the COVID-19 response in the early days that became a model that other states copied. That business-minded legislature, who wasn't scared to tackle some sacred cows, came in and tackled them. And so now we're in the second quarter, the second year, and we're asking them to take that same approach and take a look at our tax code and take a look at some sensible tax reform pieces that can be done. And I'm gonna talk about those in more detail in a second. In a second, we also think that infrastructure is also right for taking a good, hard, fresh look. And there's some creative ideas coming out on that. And then the, sec the third part of this year, this second quarter is redistricting. Later this year, the, the America will count its people. They will turn that into a census that they send down to the states and the states will take that and legislatures across the country will redraw lines. And that's gonna happen uh, later this year or maybe early next year. A quick sneak peek to next year, third quarter, the third year of this term. We think that's gonna be all about workforce and education and here's why. The last year during the pandemic, so many kids have had to stay home. So many kids have had their education system disrupted. So many schools have had to go on again, off again to deal with this. There's no doubt there's going to be a learning gap over the last year and a half. And there's no doubt that the testing that's being done right now will show that we've got a lot of work to do next year. And so we think next year will end up, the need will be obvious for what we're calling an Apollo type mission to be really creative and aggressive to remediate that learning gap and, buy, and catch kids up and to make sure that they're ready for not just uh, school, but also the workforce that's waiting for them. So we think that'll be next year's third quarter, but enough of the sneak peek for next year. Let's talk about this year, the second quarter, and let's get into some of the tax reform issues. So why now? Why is it a big deal now to deal with tax reform? Well, there's a couple obvious reasons. First of all, it's been a tough year. And quite frankly, tax relief can help stimulate investment and help keep businesses afloat and working families uh, operating safely. The second piece is there's no doubt the feds are looking at new taxes. We're seeing right now that the Biden administration is probably going to come out with some tax hikes pretty soon. So it's imperative that Louisiana get out ahead of that and try to provide some relief before the feds come in and, and put a wet blanket maybe on what is the beginning of some economic growth. 
Also, we know our neighbors to the east and west in Mississippi and Texas are right now trying to improve their tax code. So we got to keep up with the Joneses to make sure that we can get as much investment from those states as we possibly can and keep as much here that we already have as possible. And then lastly, quite frankly, the Louisiana Constitution says this is the year. You can only really do fundamental tax reform every other year. And if we don't take advantage this year, that means two years from now. And that's an election year. And as you know, it's pretty challenging election year to get big, bold policies done. So whether you're scared of what the feds are going to do, whether you want to stimulate a, a limping economy, or whether you want to compete with Mississippi and Texas, or if you just want to listen to the Constitution, whatever your motivation, this is the year for tax reform for a myriad of reasons. So let's take an 8,000 foot level. How does Louisiana look compared to other states we compete with? Well, the Tax Foundation and cost, uh, those are two entities in DC that are well known to be fair assessments of Louisiana, uh, excuse me, American tax codes. And we rank 42nd on, on, the, on the one that's used the most. That's the bottom half. That's, you know, this is like golf. You want a low score, not a high score. So 42nd ain't very good. And so it's important to understand why is that? You know, because you can really get overwhelmed with the numbers and, oh, it's not fixable. So why are we 42nd? Well, in our mind, there's three clear buckets of why we're 42nd and three clear buckets. If we make improvement, we can drive up that ranking list. The first, it's how we collect sales taxes, not the amount, how we collect them. It's very out of whack with the rest of the country. It's very disruptive to small business. And I'm going to dive deep on that collection process in a second. Second, it's our income tax rates. Now, in Louisiana, we have high income tax rates, but there are a myriad of exemptions and credits which allow people, if you've got a smart CPA at the, at, near you, to maybe buy down that rate. But for most Louisianans, they just see that high rate. It makes us un look uncompetitive. So we've got to tackle those high rates we have at the baseline on corporate and income tax. And then the last piece is what I call the scarlet letter taxes. It's the couple of taxes that just stick out like a sore thumb. And it's this red glowing scarlet letter on our chest economically when we go out and compete for jobs. And basically the big two are the franchise tax and the inventory tax. They're ugly, they're unnecessary, they're um, disruptive to our economy. And we're gonna talk about those three in a second, those couple of taxes in a second. So the big three buckets we gotta fix, how we collect sales taxes, the sheer you know, uh, severity of our income tax rates, and the scarlet letter taxes that we've got to find a way to start phasing out. So first, let's compare ourselves to our neighbor to the West, Texas. Well, they don't have an income tax. They don't have a corporate income tax. They don't have a franchise tax. And they have centralized sales tax collections. They don't have that um, you know, crazy, uh, excuse me, crazy sales tax collection process that we have in Louisiana. You can see that we, how we compare with that. And you know, look, we, we have to admit, we're always competing with Texas for jobs, right? But oftentimes when I, when I say that and we, we hear from businesses or policymakers, they say, oh man, that's not fair. Texas is big, they got scale. You can't compare us to Texas, that doesn't count. You gotta give a better comparison. Well, what about little brother? What about the butt of the jokes? What about the state that we always used to tell ourselves, hey, at least we're not Mississippi. You know, that's something we always tell ourselves, but it's time for us to take a good hard look in the mirror. Mississippi has a lower individual income tax rate. They have a lower corporate tax rate. They have begun to phase out their franchise tax. They have a lower severance tax on oil and gas, and they have a centralized sales tax collection. They don't have the type we have. So Mississippi's got some interesting laws on the books right now. And right now they're in the legislature trying to phase out their income tax completely. And whether they do that or not, I'm not sure, but I tell you what, they are right now trying their best to make themselves more competitive. So we have to be aware. Texas already has a better tax code as far as attracting investment. Mississippi smells blood and they're trying to do the same thing. We got to compete. We got to fix some of those issues we've had for a long, long time. So how do you do that? What are the solutions? Well, the good and bad is this. The solutions are the same ones that have been bouncing around the Capitol for decades. The solutions are the same ones that many businesses have been talking about for decades. And the solutions are the same ones that many of kind of the old school status quo used to give lip service to, but not try to address for decades. But we think this new business-minded legislature, the one who understands Main Street as well as any legislature we've ever seen, is willing to tackle these in a big way. In fact, usually it's the business community going to the legislature saying, please look at these tax situations. And they'll say, we'll see what we can do. This year's different. This year we have the leadership in the House and the Senate. Senator McMath mentioned Senator Paige Cortez, who he's working with today. Senator, I mean, Speaker Clay Shecksteiner is the same way. Those leaders have come to us saying, we want to work on a solution. We're drafting bills. We want to get this done. The chairs of the two tax writing committees on the House side 
um, House Chairman uh, Ways and Means, Stuart Bishop, on the Senate side, Brett Alland, Chair of Reverend Fisk, both of those gentlemen coming to us saying, hey, we, we're drafting bills. We want solutions. We're going to get something done. There is a different approach this year, and it's the legislature drafting bills telling us, buckle your chin strap. We're going to work to fix some of these things. That's why we're excited. That's why we're more optimistic than we've ever been before. So let's talk about some of these a little bit deeper. Let's get to centralized sales tax collection. What does that even mean? In Louisiana, you've got over 55, almost 60 different sales tax collectors. And if you are a Louisiana business that has customers in multiple parishes, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You've got multiple parishes with multiple collectors who have multiple different ways they assess you, multiple different ways that they want you to pay, and they have multiple different audit firms on standby ready to come knock on your door and do overlapping audits at time. There are many small businesses I talk to, they say they don't remember the last time they have not been under audit in Louisiana. That is unacceptable. That is not fair. And what people in Louisiana realize, that is not how the rest of the country works. In the rest of the country, there is one collector in, for the state in, in, and locals. And in other, in other uh, states, they have one audit ability. So if you get audited, hey, you go through an audit, everyone gets their answers, you move on. In Louisiana, we've got a myriad, dozens and dozens of different collectors, dozens and dozens of different audit firms that can come after you. It's not fair. It adds unnecessary cost to small business. And so if you are a main street business in Louisiana, those types of small businesses that everyone loves to campaign on and say how much they want to protect, those are the ones that get hurt the most by this system. Those are the ones that are being penalized. And it's not fair. If you're a big out-of-state conglomerate, you can get through this, no big deal. But if you are a small mom and pop that has battled through the pandemic for the last year and a half, you get penalized by this. And you look at Mississippi and Texas, they don't do it. In fact, it's just us in Colorado who are left doing it this way, and it needs to change. And I think it can change. And here's why I think it can change. I want to do a comparison between Wayfair and not fair. So let's look at Wayfair for a second. If you're Wayfair, if you're one of these big online retailers that do not have brick and mortar here in Louisiana, as a customer, you can go buy from them. Wayfair has one centralized board they pay the sales tax to. That one centralized board distributes those dollars to state and local government. It works just fine. No one complains. If the state of Louisiana or locals don't think Wayfair is, um, is, is complying, they send up an audit, they get the answers, it all flows through from that one centralized board. But if you are a small business in Louisiana, you don't have that right. If you're a small business in Louisiana, you have multiple different collectors and multiple, multiple different auditors always knocking on your door. You have to have an army of accountants and CPAs on the standby to make sure that you can simply just pay the taxes you owe. We have some small businesses that tell us they get bills from school boards and other parishes because that school board thinks they had a customer in that parish and the business has to prove that they didn't. That's not a bill. That's not an assessment. That's a hostage note. And that doesn't need to happen that way. And so we are working right now with the legislature and our friends in local government to come up with a compromise bill that can centralize collections, put us more in line with other states, make sure that every tax is owed is paid but also take away that unnecessary cost and red tape that is strangling small business in Louisiana. I am optimistic we're going to get a compromise, and it's not going to be a compromise that's perfect for business or perfect for local government, but I do think it will be a compromise that works, that is impactful, and that can truly bring us into the 21st century of where we need to be and how small business can compete with these out-of-state online conglomerates in the new world. And so stay tuned on that. This is the top priority for the business community to centralize these sales tax collections. Let's talk about the income tax code for a second. I mentioned we, mentioned we have the highest top rate compared to other states, especially our competitors. Right now in Louisiana, our top individual rate is 6% and our top corporate rate is 8%. But everyone knows you can use exemptions and credits and buy that rate down. Well, wouldn't it be easier if you use a couple of exemptions eliminated them and lowered that rate for everyone. Make our income tax rates more flat and fair for everyone. Easier to comply, it improves us on the rankings, no one gets hurt, but you take away the gimmetry and the games, gamesmanship that happens in paying taxes in Louisiana. I'll give you one example. The FIT, the Federal Income Tax Deduction. Every year Louisianans pay federal taxes. Every year they get to write those taxes off on their state tax code. It's called the FIT, the Federal Income Tax Deduction. That number last year was $870 million. 
if we eliminate that deduction, lower taxes by $870 million, you can bring that top income tax rate down maybe to four or five. That corporate rate maybe down to five or six. All of a sudden, we start competing more with our neighboring states, all while using exemptions on the books to pay for it. So it just makes too much sense. And I think something like that also has a strong chance of happening this session. Next, the scarlet letter taxes, the ones that we just have to confront. They're dogs. They're ugly. We got to find a way to get out of the business of taxing these things. Let me talk about two of those. The franchise tax. If you've ever been to a bar, you don't have to show a raise of hands. I'm assuming all of you have been to a bar at one point in your life. You probably pay a cover charge at some point to get in. Didn't matter if you're going to buy a beer or not or listen to music or not. You pay just for the privilege of walking in the door. Well, Louisiana has a cover charge for business. Just for the privilege of operating this state, we have a cover charge. It's called the franchise tax. You pay it whether you earn money or not, whether you lose money, whether you're going out of business or staying in business. You pay just for the privilege of being here. Smart states have gotten out of it. Even Mississippi has begun to phase this out. We got to start phasing this out right now. Take the cover charge away from doing business in Louisiana. And the next one's the inventory tax. In Louisiana, we tax you just for having inventory. That's why too many companies have to move inventory out of state that they would like to keep here just because other states don't tax this. It's unnecessary, it's burdensome, and it drives away investment that should be coming here. And so if we start the phase down of that inventory tax, we think we can start bringing back some of those major investment opportunities that have inventory and, 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 and start rebuilding some of that economic opportunity we lost over the last several years. So those two taxes, inventory and franchise tax, major scarlet letters, major opportunity this, this year, we think to start phasing some of those down. And the last one I wanna bring up in the specific is severance tax. Right now I mentioned we produce a lot of our petroleum offshore and a piece of that is because there's a lot of oil and gas out there. Another piece of that is an aggressive trial bar and a high severance tax has quite frankly disincentivized um, producers from going onshore very much over the last decade or so. We're trying to fix the trial lawyer issue but while we're doing that, let's focus on severance tax. And if we can lower some of that and incentivize companies to come back and take a fresh look at some of our non-federal water opportunities, maybe we can start rebuilding some of that lost market, which will help our service companies more than not. So that's a big issue that's also being looked at this session. So I mentioned how we collect sales taxes. We're working right now to try to compromise with local government to get there. Lowering income tax rates, using exemptions to do it so it's a revenue neutral approach starting the phase down of the scarlet letter taxes and trying to improve sovereign tax. Those are the big kahunas for this session that we'll be working with our partners in the legislature to try to get movement on. Now, there are some other issues. Infrastructure. Everyone knows we need more investment in infrastructure. Everyone knows we need accountability and efficiency in the Department of Transportation and Development. And everyone knows how you pay for this is controversial. It is controversial. Everyone hates investing in that but it's time for us to, to really find solutions and stop living in the talking point world of this issue. That means we have to look at new revenues or ex dedicating existing revenues. A gas tax will be debated and you'll have listed projects in there. There's also several bills introduced that rededicate existing tax dollars, sales tax dollars, and putting some of those dollars to infrastructure. There's also a thought of maybe using some new proceeds like from things like sports wagering or others to invest in infrastructure. However it gets done, there does need to be some new investment in infrastructure, not just because it's the right thing to do, but also if we're gonna match some of the federal dollars coming down on a new infrastructure bill, we have to have revenue to do it. And so I think you'll see the most uh, probing and insightful debate on infrastructure we've seen in a long time in the, in the Capitol. And quite frankly, I think it's a long time coming. I mentioned redistricting and I mentioned how we're gonna get those numbers. Um, later this fall, maybe early in the spring, you will see a redistricting session your legislative delegation will have to draw, redraw their own lines, as well as uh, the lines for Congress, as well as the lines for the, the Judiciary, the Public Service Commission, and the State Board of Education. One thing for the North Shore to keep in mind, in the last 10 years, we think there's, that numbers are gonna show there's been a lot of growth in your area. You, you are in a growth area. Other parts of the state are not. And so the growth that you have will either become its own district go into other districts, be used one way or another. So take a look, work with your delegation, figure out the right way to make sure that you are represented adequately. And look, there's a lot of way to draw the lines. I would just urge you to stay involved, work with your local delegation, figure out the right way that maximizes what you all are looking for in your local representation, but definitely pay attention.
And the last piece is judicial modernization. Uh, we've, looked, we've looked over the last couple of years at the, this important third branch of government. We've tried to find ways to improve its efficiency to bring common sense legal reforms. And what it has shown, there's some modernization that's needed. The way we fund our court systems is out of whack with other states. Too many of our court systems don't have a website. Too many of our court systems don't have the ability to online file or, or work electronically that communicate with other court systems. So many businesses and law firms are kind of stuck in a rut on that. We have to modernize our judicial system. And the good news is there are several reform-minded leaders in the judiciary who agree with us. In fact, you all have a, a native son in this area, Justice Will Crane, who's elected the Supreme Court. He is awesome. He's one of the most reform-minded, um, sensible jurists that we have in Louisiana, and we're so glad that he ran for the Supreme Court, and he's going to do a great job in the years to come there. But he also understands, I think, I don't want to speak for him, that the judiciary also has to take sensible steps to bring themselves into the modern world, and, and we're going to work with him and many others to try to help them get there so taxpayers know how that important branch of government works, how it's spending their money, and how they can make their voice heard in that process. So having said all that, when you look outside your quarantine window, you should see this. There's opportunity everywhere. Yeah, the last year and a half has been a stinker in a lot of ways, but man, we got great opportunity. We have a business-minded legislature who did great things on legal reform last year, and they're hungry for more and looking at tax reform this year. We've got a state and local government that quite frankly hasn't had any cuts yet, and they've got revenue to invest in priorities that are out there. And we've got a business community that is scratched and clawed through tough times and ready to re rebuild, reinvest, and rebound this year. And so we are optimistic. We're going to work our tails off with our local partners and businesses and policymakers to make sure that Louisiana does not waste this opportunity. This is a great opportunity to take bold action on long-standing problems. This is a great opportunity to use all those federal stimulus dollars that are being thrown around the country to invest in things that matter, like infrastructure like the unemployment trust fund, like early education. Use it for things that matter, not for things that just some insider in some dark hallway want. And I think this legislature is focused on that. So we have a great opportunity. It's a great moment. We see sunshine and rainbows outside. And we see the opportunity out there. So here's what we're asking you to consider doing. Be involved with your local chamber. Lacey and her team, they're gonna keep you updated. You can also stay updated from us. If you text LAVI, to 66866, we'll sign you up for our updates. And every day in session, you'll get an email from us. It'll tell you what bills happened this day, what were the outcomes, what bills are coming up tomorrow, what's the background, and how you can make your voice heard. We're gonna give you one button to click where you can let your legislators know where you stand on the issues. Trust me, they wanna hear from you. I can't tell you how many times I talk to a legislator and they say, man, I'm hearing from my business back home. I get it, it's a real issue. But when they don't hear from you, they think it's not a real issue and you can't blame them. So we'll be up there advocating on your behalf. I know Lacey will be doing the same thing from her from her seat, but it's up to you also to make your voice heard. So please text LABI to 66866 to get our updates and, and find your own way to chime in at the right time. If you're a social media person, this is how you can find us. And look, it's not just to kind of look uh, for, for what we cook for dinner that night and vacation photos. This is where we put issues out that you need to know about that can help improve your business. So like and share some of these social media opportunities we're at. We'd love to kind of have your feedback and have you get some information we put out there, especially during session. And lastly, if you're not a member of the local chamber, please join. If you're not a member of Lobby, please join. We need your membership. We need your ideas. We need your involvement. The stronger and more um, collaborative our, our delegation, our, our universe is, the more effective we can be for the business community at the Capitol. And so please, there's never been a more important time to join your local and state um, business group. We're here to work for you, to represent you, to serve you. If you let us know what works for you, we'll, we'll work our hardest to make sure that it happens in the Capitol, whether it be in Baton Rouge or DC. So, so with that, um, be glad to, uh, I'll stop the share now um and take any questions comments that folks have and, and thanks again for the invitation and for all the work that you all do day in day out in the business community well um steven that was plenty that's like drinking from a fire hose uh you, you showed a lot and i know we're gonna have opportunity now people can text in or type in their questions and uh We'll get help from Jessica uh, uh, at the chamber office, kind of get those to you. We kind of maybe read those on air. 
Um, oh, I want to also I missed something earlier. Uh, we have our, our representative Larry uh, Fireman, who's also uh, joining us. Larry today. Freeman. Freeman. I'm sorry, Freeman. I miss miss his name. Uh, Larry's also joining us today in the session. Larry's another great one. Y'all 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 send one good one after another up to Baton Rouge. We appreciate it. Stephen, the first question I think that came across was we mentioned the franchise tax, inventory tax. You mentioned how we can you know. The chamber is all about having our members uh, engage and the chamber, the biggest thing they do is advocacy, working with other chambers as well. We stay very connected with other chambers and advocacy about these kind of issues where the businesses who join us say, we're counting on the chamber to represent us and to, to push us out because they can't drive up to Baton Rouge every day. They can't be there. They don't know when these things are gonna happen. They can't always do this. What can our members do to really push forward on these two issues you discussed other than just saying the text there? Um, and really what are the chances? Uh, you find, or, or what are the blockades from having something done with the franchise tax and the inventory tax? So the on the first part of your question, you're right. Business cannot go to Baton Rouge every day, and that, that would be unrealistic. But they need to know that the people who are opposed to business, oftentimes they can, and they do, and they show up in huge numbers. There's many times in committee where there's a couple of us for business and there's an army of folks on the other side that will spend all day there, all day, you know, leaning on these folks, telling the other side of the story. So we have to be your voice. And the best way we can be your voice is to A, keep us informed, but B, you can chime in. That's why we went to an email update, you know, model where we can send out daily updates and all you have to do is click a button to let your voice heard. Every legislature I know, they have someone monitoring their emails uh, every single day and they get updates because we hear from them. So you can. I think every business owner, they have a thumb, they can click a button and it, don't be surprised at how impactful that moment is. On the possibility of those issues, um, look, I, I do think it is possible when it comes to the franchise tax. You know, it, it's hard to even get a clear number in all frankness from the Department of Revenue of how much the corporate income tax is the franchise tax because it's buried within the numbers that the legislature sees. I've seen some estimates. If you look at the last tax exemption budget, it's about $140 million. But you hear some testimony, they say, oh no, it's more like four or $500 million. The fact that we can't even tell how much the state's collecting by the franchise tax is a problem. And so that's why that needs to be smoked out. But I mentioned the FIT, the federal income tax deduction. You know, the corporate income tax code also has an FIT. You know, legislatures may use that FIT to buy down income tax rates or buy down some of the franchise or some of both. The other piece is if you believe in free markets, if you believe in free enterprise like we do, um, if you start to phase down that franchise tax, we do think it will help spur new investment. New investment means new tax proceeds for the state. So if you look at that type of economic model, we do think if you attract more investment, Rising tide lifts all boats. The state will benefit more employees. People will get jobs. And so phasing down um, franchise tax does have a cost benefit for that. And so we need to make that argument as well. On the inventory tax, the challenge is local government collects it and state government gives a partial credit for it. And so you have to phase it down in a way that you can help local government supplement that income. And so we are working on models to do that right now. And I think there's an opportunity possibly to find a compromise on that that could work. But keep in mind, if we do away with the, uh, with the um, inventory tax, what that also means is we'll no longer need the credit. And the credit every year costs the state a couple hundred million dollars. And that's another couple hundred million dollars that can be used to buy down income tax rates. So maybe that reduction of a point or two can turn into three or four points. And all of a sudden you're looking at maybe a 4% income tax rate as compared to a six or eight. So look, it's a process. We're going to be working with local government policymakers to find those offsets and make those economic development arguments. But if I'm a business owner on this call, don't worry about that at this point. What you need to worry about if you can, stay informed, find ways to make your voice heard. And if you can't drive to Baton Rouge, no one expects you to. We can be your voice. But you can send an email and you can reach out to your local legislator and say, hey, can we have a cup of coffee? Or can we spend five minutes on the phone and just let them know why these taxes are important to you and it'll go a long way. And we do that. I mean, I can say for those people who are joining us, the Advocacy Public Policy Committee the Chamber gets our legislators and they're all open to talk to us. And we have sessions with them in person, virtual as well, to kind of bring these sessions up during the session. Uh, awesome. so we tell them it's great. We can engage that way too. Um, hey, Steve, we have one of the questions came through. It says, please tell us about Lobby's regional PAC history and impact and importance of them. 
Yeah, so, you know, at Lobby, we, we talked a lot about policy right now, and we do go deep in policy, um, as, as you can see. But also, look, we're a political organization as well. And so we have separate entities that we work with to do that. And at, at, at Lobby, there are four regional PACs. They all have their own separate board of directors and their own separate, uh, you know, uh, endorsement process. But we have North PAC, South PAC, East PAC, and West PAC. And those PACs, uh, every time there's an open seat, they send out questionnaires for candidates, uh, they do interviews, uh, they make endorsements, um, and they get involved in campaigns. And so if you are interested in joining the PAC, if you're interested as a business of having a voice on who is going to represent you in the years to come in the legislature and the State Board of Education and elsewhere, please reach out and, and join our PACs. We would love to have your investment involvement because again, we're sitting here in Baton Rouge. And we want to make smart endorsements in, in other regions and that we depend on our regional PAC voices to tell us what's best for those communities. And so um, if anyone wants to learn more about our PACs, um, they can either uh, contact me, go to our website, or they can contact Bo Staples in our office, who is our political director and, and, and kind of manages those PACs on our behalf. Um, see, let me go back to the, we brought up the, uh, the oil and gas lease that has been, you know, um, stopped. Uh, I think it's the big question I have people say is, what's the advantage of stopping that? Why would um, President Biden do this? What's the advantage to it? And how can we, of course, because there's been a huge impact to us, it's going to be, um, how, how, what, what can we really do to change that? Um, there is no advantage to it. <laughs> it, it was a bad decision. Um, you know, I want to be respectful, but the truth is it was just a bad decision. When President Biden made the decision, what he said was, this is going to help us improve environment, uh, environmental protection around the world. And in fact, I would argue this policy does the exact opposite. Instead of depending on the American energy uh, economy, instead of depending on American energy producers that have led the world in R&D on how to improve environmentally friendly ways to produce natural resources, instead, instead of bringing those folks in and saying, I want you to go even faster, he shut them out. He said, I don't want you to produce anymore. I want you to go to countries like Russia and Iran and others that don't have the safeguards we have, that don't care much about environmental protection or employee rights. That's where we're sending energy producers to go find oil and gas, because as a country, we're now saying we don't want you producing here. So if you care about jobs, if you care about economic growth, or if you care about environmental protection, any three of those, you have to, if you look through that lens, the, the leasing ban is a mistake. It's harmful for all those fronts. And there is no advantage to it. And so I'm hoping that that was a knee-jerk reaction, that at some point cooler heads will prevail. And at some point they will look and say, you know what, let's start utilizing environmentally safe ways to produce energy as compared to less environmentally friendly ways to do it around the globe. And the Gulf of Mexico especially has a great story to tell on that. Um, you know, if you look at some of the opportunity there, the fact that we can produce oil and gas revenues there, we can put them in pipelines and ship them all over the world. That, you know, that, that's a huge benefit for the entire country. And at some point, states like California and New York and others who, who love to say they don't want to have any, any energy solution whatsoever, they depend on states like Louisiana to provide that product they need for their economies to grow. They're going to like working with us a whole lot more than Russia and Iran, trust me. And they're going to learn that lesson hopefully sooner rather than later. Thank you. Um, I'm reading one of our questions that just came in from uh, Albert. He says, did you just say the state can't tell us how much they collect in franchise tax? It would be 140 million to 400 million, question uh, mark. All our legislatures on this call should definitely get that answered immediately. How do you expect taxpayers to approve any new taxes? You are correct. It, it is frustrating. When it comes to the franchise tax, the numbers are, are baked into the corporate income tax. And so the state, when they go tell legislators what it is, they say, here's how much we collected in, in corporate income tax. And then when the question comes, well, how much of that is the franchise tax? You'll get different answers depending on who you ask. It's not clear right now. So what we look to is the tax exemption budget. And if you look at the latest tax exemption budget we have, that number was about $145 million. But I guarantee you, if we ran a bill to phase out the franchise tax, it said it, it's going to cost $140 million, and here's the way we think we can account that. I guarantee you, you're going to have someone come to the, cap, to the table in a committee and say, no, 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 it's much more than that. Trust us. It's like closer to three or $400 million. So it's going to say a different number than the tax exemption budget says. So it's confusing. It's un, I think it's intentionally and unnecessarily confusing. 
And it's, it's been a frustration for a long time in the capital that the Department of Revenue cannot give a clear number of what that franchise tax brings in. And I think the reason why is there's never been a, a, a true interest in trying to phase it out, despite how harmful it is. And hopefully that changes this session. Um, another question came in. It says, what's your read on the oil severance tax debate? Lowering taxes on a struggling industry makes the most sense, but rumors are that they are trying to raise taxes on the industry this year of all years. How likely is success in this arena? Well, if you if you believe in karma, uh, knock on wood, rub your lucky rabbit's foot, uh, whatever you want to do, it's St. Patrick's Day, so go find that four-leaf clover. Whatever it takes for good luck, today's the day to do it. Because I don't know, when you go into a session, predicting success is kind of a, a fool's errand, and so I'm not going to do that. But I will say, I do think there's a pretty deep understanding of how important the oil and gas industry is. I do think there's a pretty deep understanding that when you lower severance tax rates, what you're doing is incentivizing investment, and you're only gonna you're gonna you're only gonna see that offset whenever new investment comes in, which you wouldn't have had before. So, I think there is an understanding we have to do something to stimulate growth. So, I'm cautiously optimistic, but um, again, if if people in the real world weigh in through their emails, through that one click, through through a call, couple of copies of local legislator at home, it makes a big difference. And so, um, I, I, hopefully, you do that, and we'll keep you updated throughout session of what success looks like. Okay. You know, and, and I think, Stephen, you said that it's very right. I mean, that's what this, you guys are all about. Uh, that's this chamber, St. Tammy Chamber tries to do. So again, everybody on this call, we put the word out, but you got a question, you, you got an input, you got gripe, you got an idea, you got a suggestion. That's what that chamber is meant to do and your group is meant to do. So yeah, we're encouraging our members to stay engaged with us, to reach out, call us. The worst thing to do is to say, oh, I, got, I, I can't do a dang thing. Uh, I'm a small business, what can I do? Well, obviously there's, there's power in numbers. So, because if your voices aren't alone, it's gonna be working with your guys and with the state Tempe chamber as well. So thank you for that. Right, um, I can add to that point. If, if you don't wanna get an email blast, if you're one of those people who don't want your inbox filled up, I get it, man, we, we all have that, that issue. Send me an email at stephenw at labi.org. That's Stephen with a PH. Tell me your story of why one of these taxes makes it hard for you as a small business. Tell me your story. We can tell that story on your behalf and we can use your name or not use your name. We need examples from the real world. So if you don't want to do a whole lot, but you are concerned, send me your story, um, call me and then we'll set up a dialogue. I want to tell your story any way we can. Great. Well, Stephen, we're kind of out of time. We, we're keeping this hard on session. So thank you very much. This is extremely valuable, the work you guys do. Uh, again, to all of our people who joined us, all of our legislatures, thank you for joining us this session. Uh, it is recorded, so go back and listen to it again because some of those numbers were scary, uh, which you gave, but it's good to uh, get get the information out. And again, you, just one more time, you mentioned that uh, if you said you want to do that, the chat, I mean, the text, what, what was that number again? It was, uh, let me go two, back to Two it. parting thoughts, text LABI to 66866. There you go. And then one other parting thought, I, I just want to reiterate a point I made at the beginning. We have a business-minded legislature for the first time that I can recall in Louisiana. They want to do the right thing. They need to hear from you because when they get to the Capitol, trust me, they will hear a lot from those that don't want business to succeed, that don't want the private market to be leaned on. They will hear from the other side aggressively. They have to hear from the real world. They have to hear from Main Street. So please reach out to those folks. They want your input. That is it's very true. Stephen? Thank you very much, Stephen Waggis Pack, uh, Louisiana Association of Business and Industry. You guys are valuable. Uh, again, everybody joining us today, thank you for, for joining us today at the St. Tammany Chamber of Commerce uh, Legislative Update. It's going to be a very busy session. We will keep you guys engaged and informed, but please, as Stephen mentioned, reach back out to us. Let us help you out. Okay. Thank you for joining us today, guys. Appreciate thank you. you.